Excellent. Welcome, Nikki. Hi, there, Naomi. Hi, David. And, Hi, how are um, you? Doing, doing wonderfully well, thank you. Wonderfully well. Um, yeah, greetings to everyone who's, uh, who's been able to join us this evening. It's really wonderful to see another fantastic turnout for what is sure to be an absorbing webinar featuring Svalbard, also commonly referred to as Spitsbergen, an area of islands lying to the north of Norway and uh, within the remote Arctic Circle. As always, Nikki and I are really looking forward to exploring another fantastic dream destination with all of you. So today we have our good friends, Naomi Box and David Tange from Quark joining us to share their knowledge on this fascinating and remote part of the world. Uh, as with all our webinars, we always love engaging with you as much as we can and sincerely appreciate fielding your questions. As always, we'll once again take a few minutes at the end to dive into a Q&A session, which Nikki will be facilitating with, Dave, with Naomi and David. Uh, if you do have a question or just wanna say hi, then please use the Q&A box or the chat function provided. Right, on to the main event. Some of you may remember David actually from our extremely informative uh, Antarctica webinar that he did a few weeks back when he went into some depth about what adventure cruising was all about and what to expect aboard one of Quark's vessels as well. Um, it was one that we actually will be using on our now almost fully subscribed Antarctica chart in November next year, the Ocean Diamond. This is Naomi's first webinar with us, but she's no stranger to polar cruising and has been with Quark since 2011. Naomi has spent a great deal of her time in sales and now operations. And uh, she's also spent a number of uh, seasons, I believe four, is it Naomi? Uh, working six. aboard <laughs> six, six, yeah. my, my mistake, six <laughs> seasons okay. um, on board as part of the expedition team during uh, Antarctica and Arctic seasons. Uh, her educational background is in archaeological sciences and uh, biological anthropology. So she's got a really strong scientific background as well, uh, coupled with a Master of Science in Responsible Tourism. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to hearing more about this remote part of the world. I know Nikki is as well. So without further ado, it's uh, over to Naomi and David. Thank you very much, Keith. And thank you to Nikki as well. And thank you for everybody uh, who are currently attending this virtual presentation about Spitsbergen and Svalbard. Uh, Naomi and I are very, very excited to share with you what will be or what would be an experience in Spitsbergen with Rock Jumper and Quack Expeditions. Uh, but before we do so, uh, just like what Keith mentioned, uh, I've been with Quack Expeditions for uh, a few years. Uh, actually, I've been with the company for eight years. And uh, I had the opportunity to travel uh, several times in the polar regions, including Antarctica, including the Arctic. Uh, I've been to Spitsbergen myself and uh, absolutely loved the experience. So uh, after the presentation, if you have any questions, Naomi and I will definitely be uh, very happy to answer any of your questions. And then I'll let Naomi uh, talk about herself yeah, so um, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, this is actually the highlight of my week. I love talking about the places that are so dear to me. And I absolutely love talking to people who are kindred spirits, people who are seeking adventure, looking to explore the world around them, and really who are keen to take in every experience that's offered to them. So a little bit about me. I've been in the industry for 14 years. Um, and uh, most recently, the jump that I made was about six years ago, just before my 40th birthday, I uh, decided to literally jump ship and leave the office and join our operations team on board. It has been one of the most incredible experiences of my life. I get to meet people uh, with similar interests, um, and I really get to share those moments of experiencing wildlife in nature. So. My background's in archaeological sciences. I was very fascinated by the landscape and the interaction between us and nature. And it kind of took me on an interesting tour throughout my career. I've been working in travel for 14 years with Quark 9 specifically. And um, every year I learn more and more and more. And I really um, think that having a sense of adventure is kind of what kept 
has kept me going all these years uh, and even more passionate about exploring these regions, even though I've been to them numerous times before. Uh, the biggest lesson I've ever learned in expedition travel is really that you were never done learning, you're never done trying, and you're just not done yet. So um, I welcome you all to come and try something new. Excellent. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, so just before we talk about Spitsbergen, uh, the one thing I would like to remind you uh, is a little bit about Quark Expedition. So who is this company uh, who, with who Rock Jumper decided to partner with uh, for their polar expedition cruising um, experience? Well, Quark, we are a polar expedition cruise specialist. So uh, we've been in the industry now for almost 30 years, so 2021 will be our 30th anniversary of operations in the polar region, and that's all we've been doing. This is part of our DNA, this is our passion, uh, this is where we go as a company is Antarctica and the Arctic. And the one thing that makes us really proud as a tour operator and really unique uh, is uh, the fact that we hire the best expedition staff member or the best polar experts uh, to travel with you on your expedition uh, with us in either Spitsbergen or in Antarctica or in Greenland, whatever the expedition you decide, we hire always the best staff. And uh, we have one expedition guide for every seven passengers. So basically we have tons of expedition staff available uh, all the time uh, to chat with you, to interact with you, uh, to show you wildlife, uh, to dine with you as well. And we have also staff coming from all around the world. So our expedition staff uh, is there to make sure that when you are coming on board uh, an expedition in the Arctic or in Antarctica, it is the most immersive experience uh, you will have in the polar region. So this is something for us that is very, very important. Uh, and Naomi will talk to you uh, about how much, uh, how immersive your experience will be uh, in Spitsbergen. But we always aim to get off the ship as much time, as many times as possible. So every morning, every afternoon, or any opportunities that we have to get off the ship, get on these Zodiacs and cruise around the icebergs to maybe uh, go see some wildlife or go see some bird cliffs or even go on land for some hikes, we always maximize our time off the ship. And when we are on the ship, well, our expedition guides uh, will engage with you. Uh, not only their primary mandate is to show you as much as possible, but they also want to make sure that you understand what you're observing when you're traveling with us uh, in the polar regions. So every single day, there will be daily recaps, there will be lectures uh, teaching you about uh, more in depth about glaciology, about polar bears, about the history, uh, about ge geology as well. So many, many conferences will be uh, delivered to you uh, throughout the expedition. One thing that I always like to highlight about Quark is also our sustainability uh, approach to our expeditions. Uh, sustainability is something that always has been part of our DNA. Uh, it's not something that just came uh, into our vision recently because everybody's turning green now. No, uh, Quack Expeditions, uh, sustainability for us has always been something that we've always taken very seriously. Uh, we were the co-founders of AACO, uh, which is the Arctic Associations of Tour Operators, uh, IATO as well. Uh, we have every year continuously looked into different initiatives to, uh, to minimize our carbon footprint uh, when, when we're traveling into the polar regions. And one single tactic that I could highlight as an example is now that we're modernizing our fleets uh, going to the polar regions, we are using the latest technology of waste management that is called MAGS for micro automation gasification system. So, uh, and this systems allow us to uh, reduce our waste by over 90%. So, so this is really a great step forward uh, into minimizing our carbon footprint. And like I said, every single year we look into uh, different tactics to do so. So sustainability 
a uh, huge driver for us. And finally, uh, and this is probably very current right now, uh, our health and safety policy uh, is, is stronger than ever. Uh, with obviously what is going on right now, uh, Quack Expeditions is working uh, with uh, health uh, and safety third parties uh, that help us um, really, you know, lay out a very good protocol and uh, system that will make sure that all of you will be safe when you're traveling with us uh, in the Arctic or in Antarctica. Uh, the great thing about expedition cruising is that uh, you are on small ships and then the experience is really outside of the ship. So you will constantly be uh, outside breathing fresh air in very tiny, small groups as well. So, so that's the really big advantage of being on an expedition cruise like Quack Expeditions and Rock Jumper. Now let's tackle the Arctic or to tackle Spitsbergen. So uh, like Keith mentioned, uh, Spitsbergen or Svalbard. Uh, so just to maybe identify what is the key differentiator. So Spit Svalbard is the archipelago of islands that is located just north of Norway. And Spitsbergen is the biggest island within the archipelago, right? So uh, when we say Spitsbergen, we refer to the big biggest island, and when we refer to Svalbard, we refer to the entire archipelago of islands. And what you're looking at right now is a full map of the different itineraries that are being offered uh, for uh, any Arctic expeditions. Uh, and today what we're going to do is we're really going to focus only on a Svalbard experience. Uh, and But a lot of people ask us, what is the best time to go to the Arctic? And I always say to people, there's no better time to go uh, to, to a destination. It's just that whenever you go, it's going to be different than another time. But just to show you very quickly, uh, in May, uh, from May to end of early August, this is the time that we typically go to Svalbard uh, to look for Arctic wildlife. It is the best time of the year to go to Svalbard, uh, to go see the different type of birds, to go see the polar bears, to go see other type of wildlife that Naomi will highlight. Otherwise, uh, in July to October, we go to Greenland. Uh, from August to September, we go to the Canadian Arctic. And then we typically uh, visit the Russian Arctic from June uh, to early August as well. So uh, those are the type of, um, th those are the destinations that we visit depending on the month of the year. But of course, uh, if you go in Spitsbergen in May uh, versus June or July, it will be a bit different, obviously, because of the uh, climate conditions, of the ice condition as well. So anytime you go is different, but it's no better, okay? So uh, from now on, I will give the uh, microphone to Naomi, who will talk to you about Spitsbergen. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Thank you for that wonderful intro. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thanks. And just... Perfect. All right. So just a few things to kind of start us off on our adventure. When we are thinking about polar expeditions, there's a few things I like to communicate to any guest from the very beginning of planning. And I like to remind them of this as well as on board. So all of the photos today you're going to see are either my own personal photos, so please don't be so judgmental, <laughs> uh, or they're from friends of mine, or submissions from our guests to what we call our photo journal uh, that happens on every single voyage that we sail. Um, this is where people take their own photos from the day and they submit them and then we share them uh, at the end of the voyage with each other. Some of the photos you see today will be taken on a very puny digital camera, my very first digital camera from years ago. And some will be taken on my D3500 uh, Nikon with a lens that's about 300 millimeters. Other photos had larger lenses, 600 millimeters. And so you'll notice there's quite a range of different um, techniques being used and different views that you will be seeing today. I like to do this because the most important part of exploring the polar regions is to set your expectations in the right place. 
Not every day are you going to have the perfect conditions. Not every day will you have the right camera on you. And so I want to make sure that you understand that it's about the experience and that while capturing it on your photo, or while capturing it on your camera, I'm sorry, um, is really important to you. It's really important to make sure that you also know that it's about putting your camera down sometimes and really taking in that moment. So traveling to the polar regions, well, what do you need to know? First of all, everything that we do is affected by wind, ice, weather, and time. Therefore, being flexible and being prepared are the two best things that you can come with. But there's one more thing that to me is probably the most important, and that is coming with a sense of adventure. What does that mean? Well, that means looking around you, looking above you, looking below you, spending time experiencing what we like to call on board as the adult scavenger hunt. It is really important not to get too caught up in what you think you're going to see and really important and looking at everything that's in front of you with a sense of wonder and awe. Uh, so today I hope to set you off on that foot and put that sense of adventure firmly into your pocket. So what do I mean by looking around? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to start a little bit on uh, the landscape in general. So yes, like David and Keith have both mentioned, Svalbard is an archipelago made of nine islands. Um, some of the geology actually dates back to 400 million years ago in the Devonian period. Now, Svalbard was located much closer than it is today to the equator, um, but during the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period, it moved from 50 degrees north to 70 degrees north. The climate today is much like the Arctic. Um, it is um, very far out for a lot of people, but still close enough and accessible for us to really explore. So while we do spend a lot of our time exploring Spitsbergen, particularly, if we do get the chance, we're going to make sure that we take you to the other islands as well. Now, we do follow AECO guidelines, which means that there are certain landing sites that we are able to go to, and that we have to follow certain rules, and I will walk you through some of those operational rules today. So what's important for you to know about looking around? Well, uh, one of the things I always like to say to people is that it doesn't matter what kind of camera you have, but it does matter that you know how to use it. So start preparing now. <laughs> if you have a new camera, if you have a new lens, and you're really excited about making sure these things work for you, there's no better time than now to get outside and to start practicing. Binoculars cannot be underestimated. We are going to expect you to join our team. And when I say that, I mean it. It's more important to us to have many sets of eyes than it is for us to just look to find you things. We want you to learn. We want you to be part of our adventure. We want you to join us. So please bring yourself a set of binoculars, a sense of adventure, and a really great camera that you know how to use. So how do we explore these regions? Well, the ship is probably one of the best ways that we explore. David, can you uh, switch to the next photo, please? The ship offers us a platform to view these fantastic landscapes. In setting the landscape uh, for your photos and for your collection of photos um, and your experience is really important. So getting outside, spending time, really taking in what you see to the left of you and what you see to the right of you, to me, there is no better place to be. So we're gonna ask you to get outside and really join us. Um, the next way that we explore would be by boat. Next, David. Thank you. Um, and that would be to see things like to move our, ourselves through the sea ice. Uh, sea ice is something that we are always in search of. And there's a few reasons for it. One is that it is absolutely beautiful to take photos of if you have the right light. Um, the other important part of sea ice is that it is the habitat for something that we are always in search of in Spitsbergen and in Svalbard in general, and that would be um, the polar bears. So using our ship as a vessel for a platform for viewing, very important, but also getting out in the zodiacs are really crucial to our operation. Next. 
So I'm not sure how many of you have been in a Zodiac before, but these are fabulous little boats. Uh, they're completely inflatable. Um, a few of the military naval units around the world do use them. I love driving them. They're one of the, my favorite things to drive. And they really allow us in a tourism sense of getting up close and personal. Now, this does look like we're a lot closer than we actually are, but that's the beauty of photography. However, being in a boat with maybe eight to 10 people is really something that we encourage. We encourage our, um, our passengers to really take a full advantage of. So being able to, to zoom around an iceberg, something that's really a wonderful experience to have, but also it allows us time to sit with that experience and to really be present on the water at the same level as the marine life and the ice, of course. Now, how do we operate? Well, one of the things that we do, so we've done ship, we've done boat, we also go to shore and we, we carry out hiking groups. So a lot of people do wonder if um, they'll be able to keep up. And this is something that constantly comes up and I want you to know, yes, you will. We have a variety of selection of hikes that we offer. We make sure that when we come to shore, we have several different groups that you can follow. We'll always have a leader. We'll always have somebody at the back in terms of a guide. And we'll always make sure that you understand that we have a contemplative group for those who perhaps want to learn a little bit more and not go as so f not go too far into the landscape, but spend more time along the shoreline, exploring the fauna and the flora and learning a little bit more about that site that we're at. Then we may split into two medium groups, which we would one would be generally a little more photography centric. So it might go a little bit slower, still a little further than the contemplative group, but something that is um, a little more of a discussion that we would have. So it wouldn't just be us talking to you. We would love you to be involved in the landscape, asking us questions, really getting down on the ground, taking those pictures up close and personal. Our other medium group might go a little bit farther and may not stop as often to have interpretive discussion, but they may have certain things along the way that they would really like to make sure that you have an opportunity with. And then we have our last group, the chargers. The chargers go as high and as far as possible on every single landing site. Now, you do not have to stay to these groups. You can switch between them every single day, it's up to you. So if you find that you're a little bit tired from scaling up the side of a mountain the, the day before, you can absolutely switch to the contemplative group in the morning um, and just have a different experience with a different person. So we discuss traveling by sea, on the ship, by boat, as well as on shore with our hiking. So now that you understand our operations, let's have a chat about wildlife. David. So when we are looking around us, this is what we are hoping to see. To me, this is one of the best experiences I've ever had with a polar bear. Now, a lot of people think with Svalbard that, you know, they kind of wonder what kind of experience they're gonna have in terms of wildlife encounters. And I'd like you to know that this is the best place for a polar bear sighting in the world. While Canada has the largest population of polar bears, ranging from anywhere, any given year of 22,000 to 26,000 bears, Svalbard estimates, as of August 2018, um, a polar bear population of around 3,500 bears. Now, with Svalbard, because of the consistent sea ice to the north, we do spend a lot of time looking for sea ice and looking out on the sea ice to have bears. Now, to me, this is an incredible sighting. To some people, they may have been disappointed. However, anything that I can see through my binos, anything I can see through my scope, anything that I can see buttery yellow and moving on the landscape is incredible because that's as close as I will have been to a polar bear uh, for the rest of my life, possibly. But what can you do if you can't see it? Well, there's always a chance that the bear will approach us and we'll get closer if we give it time. David? So this experience here was actually, is a perfect example of what happens when you wait a little bit. One thing with nature, as I'm sure you're all so aware of, is that it doesn't keep to your time. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually waited five hours for this bear to approach us and we were very lucky she did come over um we did 
have time to ID that she was a she, in fact. Um, and one thing we always get questioned about is how can we tell? So one thing I would like to ask you to do is that if you do decide to join us, you spend again time joining the team, engaging with us, asking us these great questions, looking through your binoculars, looking through our scopes, learning about how to spot a bear is probably one of the most special moments I've ever had witnessing for a guest. Um, and it's pretty important. So this bear shouldn't stay around too long. Um, it took a long time for her to come up to us, but we did get some great photos from that day. Um, what did we do after? Well, we operated something that we call our polar bear watch. We stayed against the sea ice and we waited for about 24 hours, which is fully staffed. There's always somebody up at the bridge and we do welcome you to join us uh, during our polar bear watch, which does happen in the middle of the night. So if that's not something that you're interested in, that's fine. We'll wake you up if we see a bear, but we do want you to know you are always welcome at the bridge. Next photo, David. This is one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had with a bear. Uh, I was just coasting along in my Zodiac with my group of people having a great time, enjoying the landscape, and this happened. Now, I have to tell you not to expect this, and that pains me to do so, but I feel that I would do you a disservice. Every sighting you see of a bear, doesn't matter how small it is or how large it is in life to you, it is a huge, huge, wonderful experience, and we will teach you how to help us spot. Um, so take your time looking for bears, keep your eyes out, keep trying, keep us engaged, and um, you never know what you're going to see because, David, this can happen. Now, this experience here, uh, was actually something that I like to use as an example because it shows you what happens when you have many people looking for a bear. We spotted this bear walking along a ridge and we got out into the zodiacs. So we thought we may have a great experience, maybe a chance to see her a little bit closer. She actually decided to walk out to where we were in our boats, sit down and have a sleep. It has been one of the most magical moments I've ever had. And it is definitely something that I would encourage people to, to again, participate in. This is still one of my favorite moments. And part of that is because of the people that I met during this voyage. I was not only with my father, so I was traveling with my dad, who was responsible for my sense of adventure, um, but it attracts the same sort of kindred spirits. No one else in the world who is going, no one else in the world besides the people on the ship that you were traveling with are going to know what these experiences are like. I'd like to share with you that I'm still in touch with some of these travelers from this very trip and I have traveled with them to other destinations outside of work um, since. So that sense of adventure, knowing that you're going to have these wonderful experiences are also made better by the people that you're surrounded by. So I like to start off talking about Narwhal and most people would wonder why. Most of my guiding friends would think I'm crazy, but we always get asked about Narwhal, what the likelihood is that somebody is going to see it. I'd like you to know that in my nine years of working with Cork Expeditions, I have had two experiences. I have only had one experience where I actually physically saw the Narwhal with my eyes, which I'll show you in a minute. However, this experience here was caught on a 600 milliliter, um, millimeter lens, and it's not something that I actually saw. David and I were actually on the same trip. We spot, we were heard that these were spotted, uh, that we caught up with the narwhal migration, but I really didn't actually get a chance to see it until we shared it with a ship later on. Uh, we had some wonderful people with some fantastic um, camera gear on board, and uh, we were able to bring that to life for the rest of us. It's not something I would um, say is a high possibility. I still believe and I know that they're out there and I don't want to say it's not possible because everything is possible when you're dealing with nature. But I do like to make sure that people understand that it's, uh, it is rare. And as somebody who has spent about 800 ship nights on board our vessels and a very huge part of that in the Arctic, um, I like to make sure it's quite clear from the beginning. So when did I see my other narwhal experience, David? So 
So do you see the, the narwhal in this photo? <laughs> it is a little grizzly that I share this photo, but this experience was incredible and is probably to this day, one of the most mind blowing experiences I've had. Now, this picture looks beautiful. It's composed. It's great. The water looks calm. I will come back to this photo at the end when I'm reminding you of um, some of the things I've already mentioned in terms of practicing with your camera. I'd like you to know that it can take a long time to take a good photo. It also can be really important for you to put your camera down. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. I feel like it would fail you if I didn't mention that this took a lot of time, probably three hours to capture this photo. All right, David. Okay, so blue whale, something else a lot of people ask us about. They know that there are feeding grounds. They know that these wonderful magical beasts do exist up in the Svalbard region. Um, and it's, there aren't that many in the world. So being able to capture a glimpse is something that a lot of people come to us with. And it is something that I would like you to know we do definitely spend our time looking for. They are fantastic, wonderful magical beasts. Like I've said, they eat up to four tons of krill per day. We can't always promise that they're going to be in the feeding grounds that we are aware of. And while it is rare, it is not impossible to see them. Blue whales can live up to 80 years old. Um, their blow is very distinctive. This is how we generally can find them on a clear day. Their blow is up to 12 meters in height. They can weigh up to 4,000 pounds, 400,000 pounds. Um, and they, they are almost up to 32 meters in length. To increase our chances of seeing them, one of the things we ask, again, is that we have you outside on board uh, looking from the deck uh, with us. Uh, really important to kind of know your whale blows and we will spend time with you educating you on that site. Next. So belugas, also really well known in the Svalbard region. Um, this image is perhaps a little bittersweet sweet to me, but is something that I am really proud of our team for experiencing. I'm certain that a lot of you would love to see belugas. They are beautiful, beautiful creatures. Um, and they're one of the wonderful uh, whale species that you can see in Svalbard. However, I'd like to share with you something, and that is that I didn't actually get to see this event um, unfold, unfortunately. Uh, we communicate with each other consistently in our zodiacs. We're always letting each other know of sightings. We're always letting each other know uh, in our pair uh, what we're going to do, which corner we're going to go around next. Um, and unfortunately, on this morning, I was on the other side of the bay with my zodiac pair. We were taking pictures of cute harp seals who were posing on rocks. I got the call. I asked my zodiac, full of guests, what they wanted to do. They wanted five more minutes with the harp seals. We spent five more minutes with the harp seals and unfortunately that meant that we lost out on seeing the beluga. So that brings me to another point. You can come with a sense of adventure but sometimes there is disappointment and I want you to know that it doesn't mean the experience of the harp seals was any less of an experience or that the experience with the belugas would have been more. Everywhere you are, you're going to miss out on something. So you need to come with the acceptance that what you are experiencing at that time is so amazing. Next. Next. So here's what we were experiencing that day. I absolutely think that this is one of my favorite moments from that season. I was par partially sad for missing out on the belugas but we did get a collection of beautiful photos and the harp seals just completely uh, posed for us for a good half an hour that morning. Um, so made for some wonderful photos for the photo journal as well, which we shared with everyone else. David, next photo. Um, I'm including this photo of a bearded seal. Bearded seals are quite common to see in the Arctic. Um, you can see he's been busy and that he has perhaps had a run-in with um, something a little bit bigger who was trying to eat him. Um, I include this photo to just remind you that we are in nature and that not everything is pristine. So while we did view this 
bearded seal, we did make sure that we passed on quite quickly as he'd obviously been in through a little bit of a stressful period. We wanted to make sure that he had the best chance for survival. Next. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen walrus, but to me, ah, oh, I absolutely love them. Walrus can weigh up to a thousand pounds. The males tend to hang out together because they're what we call thermotactile. They love to be close and to be touching each other. The males usually hang out together on the western side of Svalbard. The females tend to stick together with their pups on the eastern side in the archipelago. So usually when we're going around the island of Svalbard, we do see quite a lot of groupings of walrus. Um, things that I love about them, their, their tusks can get up to a meter long. They self-regulate by dilating and constricting their blood vessels. This lovely chocolatey, chocolatey colored image that you see here is because they're nice and warm and they've been basking in the sun. The next photo will show um, a little bit more of what they look like when they've come out of the water, which is quite gray and quite dull. Um, when we do a walrus approach, we do make sure that we're silent. We split our groups into small groups so that everybody gets a good amount of time spending with the walrus, taking photos, and uh, really taking in the experience because it's the sight, it's the sound, it's the smell, believe it or not, that will most likely clue you in that walrus are nearby. Next photo, please. So this photo, as you can see, it's a bit grainy and I do include it because this is one of those moments that um, I didn't see coming. I was standing at the end of a landing site and this little fella came up to myself and a guest who were having a, a wonderful conversation as one does have uh, when you're with kindred spirits. And this image is not that clear. I did not expect to have this moment at that site. I'd never seen a fox in this location before. Um, I was on the shoreline, believe it or not, uh, looking upwards. And I had my point and shoot with me. That's all I had. Uh, not a great camera. I've been through the ringer that season. He checked us out for about half an hour. We called all the other guests down once they were finished. He stuck around. As you can see, he's kind of um, half between his winter coat and his summer coat, uh, the very beginning of the season. And sometimes you can catch fox uh, completely off guard, like in the next photo. So my friend Jillian took this photo. Um, we were looking at birds. <laughs> we were actually in a place called Kittywake Canyon, uh, looking at the black-legged kittywakes, and she looked down and there was this little fella. And the next photo, David. And sometimes from the boat, you can catch our Arctic fox uh, from the water just like this, sitting on a ledge somewhere, looking down at you before you saw it. Next photo, David. One of my favorite wildlife moments uh, is actually to do with Svalbard reindeer. Now Svalbard reindeer are a bit sturdier, they're a bit stouter, they're shorter than their Canadian counterparts uh, that I'm used to. They still weigh on average about 200 pounds, but they have these magical coats that are iridescent uh, and they have these beautiful adaptations to make them perfect for this climate. Uh, they have the fur around their ears, their nose, their mouth, all to help them protect um, them from frostbite because they live in incredibly cold habitats. They also, they also sport these in, uh, double insulated coats. Uh, their coat has these long hollow guard uh, hairs and then they have shorter ones on the under fur to keep them quite warm. They are beautiful beasts to watch. Um, I actually fell in love with reindeer. Uh, being a Canadian, I never really had any experience with reindeer before, but going to Svalbard, I think this is one of those moments that we all crave as explorers, um, where you see something that is unexpected and it provokes a reaction in you that you cherish uh, from that point onwards. And so this was my moment with reindeer for my very first season guiding. And the next, so we've talked about looking around. We're going to talk about looking up. 
it's for the birds. A long time ago, as a child, I was unfortunately, as I would have said at that time, dragged around in early mornings from park to park to park with my father and his binos looking for different birds. Um, all the way from April right through the fall every single year. Well, that changed for me very quickly. Um, I think for birders, each of us have that story. Each of us have that moment that really shaped us. And uh, for me, it was actually my first trip to Antarctica and my first experience with a gentoo penguin, uh, which quickly switched from penguins to skuas. Any of you who um, love the jaggers uh, would understand that statement. They're quite incredible creatures. We'll talk a little bit about the species that you can see today. But Svalbard in the Arctic is one of the best places to see birds with over 227 species um, and over 41 that are considered annual breeders. So there's lots of opportunities to, to make sure that you check some uh, viewing and spotting off your checklists. Next slide. So this is Kitty Wake Canyon. I was discussing this a little bit further, uh, a little bit um, previous uh, when talking about the Arctic Fox. This is a fantastic place to see a kittiwake colony. And I'm not sure how much detail you can see here, but all these little white dots along the cliff face are all nests. Fantastic place to capture kittiwake, uh, kittiwakes in action. Next photo. And here again, this is the up close and personal experience I was talking about. We do ask people to calmly approach the cliffs. We do keep a safe distance from the cliffs. But the birds, of course, it's a cacophony of noise. Um, and one thing I love about it is that you see the full life cycle happening here. You see the nests, you see the juveniles who are attempting their first nests. You see the successful breeders um, season over season over season and throughout the season as well too, every time we go back. A lot of people who weren't birders, when they go to this site, they come back and they, they get it. They see why so many of us, um, are out there in the early mornings. So the black-legged kittiwakes um, happen to be one of my favorite things to photograph. They are really loud in their colonies and really um, quite incredible, um, incredibly beautiful creatures to photograph. Um, but when they're on ice and when you're in your boat, they're very quiet and they're very um, calm. So it's very easy for us to get up close and take some really lovely photos without disturbing them. Um, and I do believe that uh, I fell in love with kitty wakes quite quickly and I'm hoping to see more species eventually as I explore a little bit further. And the next photo. So I'm sure many of you are in, see, are in search of the ivory gull. Ivory gulls are something that we do um, as birders, spend a lot of time outdoors in the morning near glacial faces, looking for any speck of um, evidence that they are out there. Where we usually find them is near a bear kill site where there's remnants of seal. Um, we try to make sure that we also, when we visit tidal glaciers, that we're looking for evidence of these beautiful white birds. Uh, but usually if we do catch them, it's usually uh, scavenging off of a bear kill site. In the next photo. So in my years of working in Svalbard, um, I'd like you to know that it took me five years to see a charm again. Five years uh, of searching and I definitely wanted to see a ptarmigan. Ptarmigans, for those of you who are familiar with them, are well known for their beautiful plumage that changes depending on the season. Uh, it's quite cryptic. It's really great for camouflaging in the summer. Um, this photo was actually taken after it'd been out for about two and a half hours on a hike. Um, not at a site I'd ever heard of ptarmigan being seen at. Um, we passed through this area before, so, which means they must have been around. Um, but as we were coming back with our small group, uh, this is what we saw. We actually saw five of them in this location. The next photo. And then earlier in the season, uh, we've had these experiences as well too, where we have been able to see their wonderful winter coat and that lovely supraorbital red plumage of the male uh, very early on in the season. This trip was the first week of May. Uh, I'd never actually been that early before. 
And it was just incredible to have that experience. Fun fact about the ptarmigans, for those of you who aren't familiar, they are precocial uh, when they hatch, which means they're pretty uh, independent. Within a day or two of hatching, the chicks have their full adult feet. They have these lovely stiff feathers and they're able to walk around with their mother looking for food. Uh, absolutely beautiful to see. In the next photo, a little bit up close. On the next photo, you'll be able to see the female and the male. Now, this photo was taken by one of our resident photographers, our media ambassadors on board. Um, and it's just absolutely still one of my favorite photos just because you can see all of those wonderful feathers, those stiff feathers along the legs. Now, a lot of people ask if it is possible to see divers. It is, absolutely. For the North Americans, we call them loons. Uh, for the rest of the world, they're called divers. This is a red-throated diver. Um, and usually when we are looking for red-throated divers, there are two places I like to recommend for people to do their own observation. And one is actually just outside of Long Urban. There are a series of ponds. Um, really great place to kind of explore if you can, if you've got time in Long Urban, which is where the ship, um, uh, where the port is for the ship. Uh, and the other place would be somewhere called New London. Now, everywhere we go, we're always hoping we have our itinerary planned, but things can change. Um, so if you are really hoping to capture a red-throated diver, just make sure you keep your eyes open. Uh, I have seen them in some very strange places. So next photo, the Arctic Tern. Now this is one of my favorite birds, uh, possibly because it has the longest migration in the world. Scientists estimate that it, it flies to the moon and back three times in the span of its life just for a meal. So it's a bird after my own heart. The next slide. Now, depending on if you're North American or if you're European, you'll know this bird as a dove key or a little auk. Um, I like to reiterate what I said a little while back about spending time uh, realizing how lucky we are to have these experiences. There are several bird cliffs in and around Svalbard, and sometimes sitting and just experiencing that bird cliff and feeling the rush of birds as they swoop over top of you is actually better than trying to struggle with your camera to take a picture. If you have the opportunity to sit near a Dove Key cliff, take a few photos and then put it down and really spend your time enjoying the way they fly. Um, as birds, David, you can switch to the next photo. Uh, as, as birds go, Dove Key are quite nervous. Um, they usually sit outside of their nest and then one of them kind of gets a little spooked and the rest of them just kind of join it. They fly off, they swoop off in a wonderful uh, formation, uh, quite close to the ground actually, which makes for quite an experience. And um, the next photo kind of shows you exactly what it looks like. Um, this is an experience I wish everyone could have. Uh, there's nothing quite like sitting there watching um, this flock of birds just kind of swoop very close to you, closing your eyes, and just feeling that wind uh, that they push towards you. Next photo. Now, speaking of bird cliffs, this is my favorite bird cliff in the world. This is called Alcafelet. It's over a kilometer in length, uh, and it's on the northern edge of the island of Svalbard. The, uh, the, oh, sorry, the, um, the noise that you experience, the sound, the smell, uh, it's just like nothing you'll ever, ever experience in your life. And the Brunox guillemots are so tightly packed along all of these edges with their eggs um, that a lot of people spend time looking up and can kind of make themselves a little seasick depending on the swell in the region. Uh, if you've watched Planet Earth, you most likely have seen um, the segment that they did on the migration of the Brunex Gallimots, where the chicks hatch and in days of them hatching, they leap off the cliffs to meet their fathers to migrate to the coast of Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, and in cases, Greenland. Next photo. So Atlantic puffins is something else we are definitely in search of. Um, there are a few places that we know of that they do um, occur. Uh, everybody wants to see a puffin. Any picture of a puffin is a fantastic photo. Next photo. 
Sometimes you can get them in groups. I really encourage people to take pictures of groups of puffins. Uh, it will help you a little bit later on in your editing. Um, and sometimes you can catch them in mid-flight like this. Now, other birds that you can see along the way are purple sandpipers. We do like to make sure that they get the attention that they deserve. They are beautiful birds. We do tend to see them a lot on our hikes. Um, other birds that we see along the way would be the long-tailed skua. Uh, or our parasitic jagger or our arctic skua, and also our glaucus gull. So the glaucus gull, as you can see here, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with them, but they are the apex predator in the bird world in the Arctic. Uh, with a wingspan of over a meter and, and, and width, um, they are quite the aggressive birds, I would say. They're, they're quite opportunistic. You can capture them in a um, active kleptopiracy uh, with the <laughs> Arctic skua, uh, who will make every effort to steal whatever the glaucus skull has in its mouth. Um, but they are also just very beautiful birds to watch gliding above any of the other bird cliffs. Uh, next photo. So these guys are also in great search um, for a lot of us as birders. These are the red phalaropes or gray phalaropes, uh, depending on where you're from. Um, we know a few places that we like to, to travel to to see if we can, can find them. But again, they can be quite elusive. Um, Next photo. And one of the last birds is um, that I like to talk about out of the species that are available to see in Svalbard would be the ruddy turnstone. Uh, this photo here again is the importance of, it reminds me again of the importance of being in the moment. Um, he was fairly close to me. I actually was sitting down uh, with my group. We'd taken a bit of a break. It was pretty warm out that day, a little bit muggy, a little overcast. And um, I didn't have my camera on. Uh, I just had um, my, um, my, my, my phone, actually. So it's just, again, to remind you that sometimes it's not about the photo. It's actually about the experience. Yes, it was important for me to take this picture so I could write down the details on my own personal list. Um, but I, I do think it's important just to remind you that um, sitting in the moment is really important. OK, the next slide. And the last section is really about the importance of looking down. So what do I mean by that? Svalbard has a 10 week uh, summer growing period. While there are over 164 vascular plants in the region, um, the adaptations that these, uh, the flora have are quite incredible. And they range from having a vast root system that spreads out across the tundra to tiny hairs covering the little, the little stems that they have that, that help them with um, conducting heat. Uh, some of them have a well-developed globe as a flower head that mimics a little bit of a greenhouse effect. Um, and some of them are actually orienting to the sun. Uh, just like the image of the Arctic poppy into the top right-hand corner, uh, the flower actually, sh actually moves with the direction of the sun throughout the day in order to capture as much heat as possible. Next photo. Uh, so, if we are distracted sometimes and we forget to look down, we miss things like this. This is a polar bear print. As you can see, um, our wonderful passenger, Leah, this is her hand on the left-hand side, uh, reaching down just to make that comparison. These are fantastic things to spot. And uh, we definitely have a good chat around the size of them in comparison to other animals that we've seen. But tracks are just as important as seeing the actual animal themselves. Because it tells us a little bit about their journey, tells us about their direction and where they're going. Uh, so be curious, uh, because sometimes this happens. And other times, this happens. Uh, I actually get chills every time I see this photo. Um, as somebody who studied archaeology, I'm a big dinosaur nerd. I can't help it. Um, I had heard about this site for years. Uh, this is the site of Carl Wagen, uh, and this is a 30 centimeter uh, footprint of a uh, Cretaceous iguanodon. So this is a vegetarian dinosaur species, and this was something that I never thought we would see. This site is very inaccessible at times during the year, and we just happened to have the perfect weather window time period and nobody had booked it. So we ended up um, rearranging our schedule for the day 
And uh, in all my years of travel, this is the first time I've ever been there, but it was quite a moment to be able to put my hand down uh, in comparison. So looking down is very important. The next. So I've talked about the species. I've talked about looking up and looking down. I've also talked about knowing your camera gear. This is a perfect example why. I had a new camera. I tried my best with the waves. The swell was massive in this area. You've seen the picture uh, at the very beginning of what this image um, I was able to actually capture after three hours. But I want you to know that it took a really long time because I did have a new camera and I did have a new lens as well. So spending time with your camera, getting to know it, preparing for your trip is going to set you up for success. Um, luckily, I did have my other camera on me during that moment. I did capture some beautiful photos, but I don't want you to struggle. I want you to come prepared. I want you to come with a sense of adventure and flexibility and know that um, when you come with all of these things, great things will happen. And the last thing I'd like to share with you as well is something that I'm in search of. And that is something that makes a lot of people laugh. It is a snow bunting. I've seen many snow buntings in my years around Long Yearbun, but I have a really hard time capturing them with my camera. I just don't happen to be in the right place. I got a lot of um, bird behind uh, when I do try to take pictures of snow buntings, but snow buntings are such a wonderful sight to see and sound to hear, being the only songbird in the Arctic. Uh, this photo was actually taken by um, a gentleman called Tom Wilderbring uh, and is posted on the Audubon, Audubon website um, because I just have not been lucky enough to capture uh, a snow bunting on my own, uh, my own, um, my own endeavors. Uh, and also we rarely get them submitted to the photo journal, which just goes to show you how difficult it can be to film a snow bunting. Uh, and with that, I'd like to just offer you um, a piece of advice. And that is again, just to come armed with a sense of adventure and uh, really knowing that there is just so much out there to see and explore and that you're doing yourself a huge service anytime uh, you get on board with us. So thank you. Um. Naomi, thank you so much. I think Arctic has just got a little bit higher up on my wish list to travel. I haven't yet had the experience of traveling there. And what a great, um, great place to go. Um, it's got a couple of questions that come through. So I'd love to ask Fabulous. you. Um, the first one is, um, are you using hybrid icebreakers yet? No, no, we don't. We don't have any in our fleet at this moment. Oh, great. And David, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in with Q&A, but I think both Keith and you wanted to do Absolutely. some chatting. So let me hand it over to you first. I'm jumping the gun here. <laughs> no problem at all, Mickey. Uh, David, uh, from, from your side, I know you wanted to, uh, to bring up something. Yeah, so um, what I wanted to do is just to show very quickly uh, the different voyages that are being offered to Spitsbergen. So Quack Expeditions and Rock Jumper, we offer uh, four different type of itineraries. Uh, and obviously, the longer you stay, uh, the more you can see all the different animals that Naomi has uh, shown uh, during her part of the presentation. Of course, we cannot guarantee anything, as she well explained. Uh, it's all part of the experience, it's part of the surprise. Uh, but the shortest itinerary that we offer is a seven days itinerary. Uh, and all of our Spitsbergen itineraries start from Oslo. So as a person, as a client or future traveler, you would have to fly from wherever you come from to Oslo. And then once you arrive in Oslo, you will have a pre-expedition hotel night offered. And then the next day, uh, we will fly you on a private chartered plane from Oslo all the way to Longyearbyen, where uh, you will be transferred to the ship. And then uh, you will go on your expedition. And then at the end, you will fly back to Oslo. So the, sh the shortest itinerary is seven days. Uh, we also offer a 10 days itinerary uh, in the 11 days, and then we also offer a 14 days as well. And just like what I said, the more time you stay, obviously the more wildlife encounter opportunities there will be. We also have a photography uh, focused itinerary uh, in Spitsbergen in May, 2021. So if you are a very passionate 
person about photography and wildlife, this is definitely a great itinerary for you to be part of as well. Okay, very quickly, uh, just to refresh your memory or to introduce you the ships uh, that you could be traveling on board if you come with in Spitsbergen with Rock Jumper and Quark. Uh, the very first one is the Ultramarine. So the Ultramarine is a brand new build ship that is currently in its final phase of construction. Uh, it'll be ready for sale in. February 2021, and its inaugural expedition voyage will be in Spitsbergen in May 2021. So we're very, very excited about that. And uh, if you are a person who likes to have this little extra comfort, uh, spacious suites, private balcony, a, a lot of amenities on board, including a spa, a sauna, yoga classes. This is the type of onboard experience that the Ultramarine will be offering, in addition to, of course, your off-ship experience in Spitsbergen. But we also uh, offer another ship that is called the uh, Ocean Adventure. Uh, the Ocean Adventure is 128 uh, passenger capacity. Uh, and it is a ship that uh, Quark Expeditions has been using for many, many years. Uh, for many of our expedition staff, uh, they really, really love the Ocean Adventure uh, because of its rusticness, uh, because also of the space on the deck as well. So uh, there's lots of space for passengers to walk around and take some pictures. Great ship as well to uh, observe uh, birds. So if you are a birder, this is a great ship uh, to walk around and have easy access of different points. So you have this amazing view of birds flying around the ship. Uh, just to, again, talk about the on-ship experience. Uh, so like I said at the very beginning of the presentation, the primary experience that Quark and the expedition staff wants to provide to you is of course to spend as much time as possible outside the ship, but we will be spending some time on the ship as well. Uh, of course, dining, of course, uh, traveling from point A to point B. And while this is happening, uh, our expedition staff will be uh, presenting some recaps, uh, some conferences, giving additional information about uh, the birds that have been seen throughout the day, or the polar bear, or the glaciology. So every day, you're going to be learning even more about the different components of Spitsbergen. And if they are not presenting, well, the staff is on deck looking out for wildlife. And of course, they invite you uh, to come and join them. And if they see a polar bear, if they see any type of birds or wildlife, they will definitely be there to show it to you and to explain to you uh, what is going on. And it's definitely something very common, uh, you know, traveling to uh, Spitsburg and being a, a huge archipelago and concentration of wildlife, uh, wildlife encounters are very, very common. One thing that uh, we always encourage people, obviously, during our voyages is to interact with the other passengers. Uh, we have uh, this incredible privilege of having people from all around the world traveling with us. Uh, so, of course, uh, whenever we're on board the ship, uh, there will be a lots of free time for you to interact uh, with people who are coming from Asia, from uh, Australia, from Europe. Uh, we, have be, we have expedition staff members coming also from all parts of the world. Uh, so this is also a great opportunity to, uh, to make new friendships. If you are worried about food, I'm telling you, don't. Don't worry. There's lots of food on board the ship and also a very large variety as well. Uh, so if you are a foodie like me, you will be completely satisfied from breakfast buffet uh, to lunch buffet to a forced course meal uh, for dinner time. Uh, if you are a vegetarian, if you are vegan, if you have any specific diet requirements, we have this flexibility to accommodate. Uh, the only thing we unfortunately cannot do uh, would be kosher food or halal food. Uh, but if you have any allergies, uh, we of course do require to know them ahead of events. And you would have the opportunity to mark that in your passenger forms once you confirm a trip with Rock Jumper and Quack Expeditions. And, and just to circle back, uh, if you are a person who likes to uh, do your daily exercise, 
uh, on the ultramarine and also on the ocean adventure. We do have a gym available for you uh, to, uh, to have access to 24 hours so that you can do your daily exercise. And the most important place on the ship is the bar and lounge where you can uh, enjoy a nice cocktail uh, while the ship is traveling, okay? Just a few reminder, we do have lots of activities uh, being offered during your expedition. All the landings, all the Zodiac cruises, all the hikes are included for your Spitsbergen activities. So this is all part of the experience. Uh, for those of you who like a little bit of extra adventure, uh, we also offer the opportunity to do a polar plunge. Of course, we don't push anybody to do that. So if you are like me, if you're like Naomi, uh, and you like to experience this very cold water once in your life, uh, we will give you that opportunity to jump in the water, uh, which uh, is very, very nice. Not everybody agrees with me, but I strongly encourage it. Uh, we also have some extra activities. So um, if you do enjoy, um, if you know you're gonna go there only once in your life, and uh, you want to optimize your expedition cruise experience in Spitsbergen, uh, we also do include uh, offer uh, kayaking. So uh, if you are an avid kayaker, we have the sea kayaking program, which basically is a rental program for the entire expedition cruise. Uh, so in about a 10 day voyage, you would be going kayaking at least five to six times, but obviously it's all depending on ice condition, on weather conditions, and also on safety conditions. Uh, but uh, if you are a kayaker, strongly, strongly recommend it. And also if you are a kayaker, but you don't necessarily want to rent a kayak for the entire trip, uh, we also have a day paddle, which is a one-time kayaking experience that you could go uh, during your expedition cruise. Finally, if you are interested uh, to come and join us in Spitsbergen, uh, this is a quick summary here of all the different departure dates that we are, that we are offering in 2021. So as you can see, both the Ultramarine and Ocean Adventure, we are offering multiple departure dates available. And currently right now, if you are interested, we are offering this great promotion of 30% off, including the uh, private chartered plane from Oslo to Long European round trip. So it is a great opportunity for you to take advantage of if you are interested. And I, of course, encourage you to reach out to Rock Jumper to learn more about the details. One thing that I'm sure you are definitely, uh, you know, questioning or wondering about is uh, about cancellation policies. We all know that right now with COVID-19, things are very different. Uh, there's a level of uncertainty right now that may not be encouraging you to uh, purchase an expedition in the future. Uh, so we do have this great booking with confidence policy uh, in case you are interested, uh, which basically gives protects your money uh, from the time of booking all the way to the 24 hour prior to departure. Uh, so if you are, uh, for example, unable to embark the ship because of COVID-19 reasons, including uh, if, if there's a quarantine measure that will make you miss the boat or uh, the, gov the, the country does not allow you to enter uh, the country, um, that will be the gateway for embarkation, we would actually uh, rebook you at 100% value of what you've paid. Or if you are, um, if you need to be a refund, we will also pr proceed to the refund as well. So uh, great flexibility right now if uh, you are considering a trip. And again, if you have any further questions, uh, Rock Jumper would be able to help you with that. Thank you. Any Thank questions? you, David. <laughs> and uh, Keith, uh, your mute is on, so you might just want to unmute. I know you wanted to mention a few words yes thank you thank you so much <laughs> it's so easy to do um yeah fantastic naomi david um incredible presentation uh really opened our eyes to the the wonders of the arctic and, and particularly uh spitzberg and svalbard area uh, certainly a beautiful part of the world one that i have not experienced yet but uh yeah certainly up there on the wish list that's for sure um but just quickly yeah before we get stuck into q a with nikki I uh, just wanted to take the opportunity to quickly let um, 
all of you know about next week's webinar. Our featured location is once again a small group of islands, but this time of a far more tropical nature. Uh, the islands in question are the Galapagos. And uh, joining us next week, we speak uh, next week to speak about this amazing archipelago is uh, much loved rock jumper Turley the Dusan Brinkhazen. Um, he actually resides in Ecuador itself, although he's currently with his family in the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, he's been in Ecuador, I think, for over 10 years now. So a lot of, lot of experience out in that part of the world. Uh, but yeah, the Galapagos certainly ticks the exotic box uh, once again in a massive way um, and is well known for having some of the most approachable wildlife on the planet and uh, some of the most bizarre as well. Uh, Dusan, as well as also in the final stages of finishing off a brand new field guide to the region, uh, which we're all very, very excited about. And uh, next week, we might just get a little sneak peek at uh, some of the plates if we're really lucky. Uh, so yeah, lots to look forward to. And uh, we really hope that you can join us again next week. Um, and then just a final reminder that the webinars are recorded and can be viewed again later. And um, yeah, there are a couple of questions. So I'll hand over to Nikki now. And um, yeah, she get some more, some more feedback and input from, uh, from yourselves, Naomi and David. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm based in Mauritius. So when I see snow, um, actually, I would just love to be cold just for a little bit. I'm <laughs> always sweating on this side. Um, Ricky asked a question after my own heart. Do we need see good sea legs to enjoy the ship uh, time and the good sea stomach? You know, everybody's different. And I do like to tell people that um, if you know that you tend towards seasickness, just come prepared, bring some medication with you. Um, I actually find that chewable ginger, well, it's not for everybody, uh, tends to help a lot with the nausea. Seasickness will come and go. Um, a lot of people adapt quite quickly, um, specifically on the 200 passenger vessels that we operate. Um, they don't tend to get too rough. Uh, the Drake Passage in Antarctica uh, has taken me down personally. I don't get seasick, um, but it has taken me down in the past. Uh, whereas around Svalbard, the swell, it can be, you know, it can be substantial, but it doesn't I don't find people are as sick as they would be in, in terms of traveling to Antarctica. However, being prepared is always the best thing that you can do. We have mint tea on board. We make sure that there's always nibbles available to you so that you can actually put something in your stomach if you're not feeling too great. Um, but the best cure is to actually get outside uh, and which is what we try to do as much as possible. Oh, great. Um, Charles is asking, there are smaller, are there smaller, less passenger ships? So example, like a 35 uh, guest passenger ship that you offer this kind uh, of Question after my own heart. I would love that. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any in our fleet at this time. It is something that we have discussed. We have had a 12 passenger vessel uh, operate in the Antarctic before. Um, and I'm hoping and I'm excited that in the future we'll have uh, varying sizes of vessels available to us. One thing I do like to mention to people is that um, 200 passengers is actually quite a good amount of people. If you've ever been on a cruise before with thousands of people it's not the same it is just not the same no matter how much you try to connect with people you'll never get that experience because we have such a, a low guide to passenger ratio um, we do get to experience each uh, uh, like that feeling of knowing each other it does become a family we're very serious when we say join us um, join us in learning about the the birds the wildlife that you're going to see join us in spotting these magical moments um, it is important to us that we we have this feeling of connection on board and one of the things we like to remind people to do is to kind of tune out to the rest of the world if they have their opportunity that assists us with creating that moment on board oh beautiful um how how many uh, bird species um do you usually see on a 14-day trip oh. Gosh, okay. so we do have a wildlife list um, and we do ask that anytime a wildlife is spotted that we make sure that you approach one of us guides to make sure that it is actually accounted for. We will do our best to make sure that we update that throughout the day. It doesn't get done once a day, it gets done a few times a day. Um, my four months, I would say traveling in Svalbard one year, 
we did, I would say on average, probably around 20 to 30 birds. I think that's a good estimate, the species of birds uh, that we've seen. Um, and just remember that sometimes it really is just a glimpse. Uh, so whether or not you see it or not, we're still gonna check it off. Um, but the best place that you can be is out in the mornings, out late at night as well too, specifically with the 24 hour daylight, um, trying to capture as many moments as you can specifically if you're a birder, get up early with us. Uh, a lot of us are up there at 4.30 in the morning, five o'clock, you won't be alone. Um, and uh, it is definitely one of the best ways to be, to be able to see this, so. Oh, great. Um, just to, sorry, yeah. just, just a quick step in there as well. Um, I was just having a look at some of our past, uh, past lists and what have you when we've done trips up there. Um, and, and yeah, interesting to say, I mean, as Naomi's mentioned, the uh, total species in the zone um, is not very high. I mean, it's not it's not like the tropics and what have you, but it's the it's the volume, you know, the sheer volume, the, the breeding colonies, um, that whole experience, and some very very special species. Um, but yeah, I was seeing on average we typically get around between thirty and thirty five species um, yeah. on those on those trips. As Naomi was saying, not you know not not high numbers, um, but very much quality. I like to set the bar low. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is, is because you never know um, what kind of enthusiasts you have on board. If it's someone who is wanting to see things during their own hours or somebody who's willing to be up there at all times of the day. Join us. Join us at all times of the day. And, and like Keith said, you'll see as much as you possibly can uh, if you're outside. So thank you for that. Um, Bob's asking, uh, which species of uh, ptarmigan do you oh, see in Skullhood? Yeah. I forgot to mention, so this is actually a subspecies of the rock ptarmigan. This is fall barred rock ptarmigan. Uh, they're a little bit sturdier and heftier. Um, there is sexual dimorphism in terms of uh, the male having um, a little bit more of a meatier body than the female, but there is quite a drastic change between the seasons as well in terms of the size of the birds. Um, I hope I've answered that question for you. I totally caught myself too and thought, oh, you didn't tell them that it's a subspecies. So um, they're a little bit larger than the Norwegian willow uh, ptarmigan again or the rock term again that you that you would know somewhere else oh. and then peter is saying uh is there going to be a rock jumper uh guide on board or only quark um keith maybe you want to jump in here yeah. and <laughs> sure absolutely um so with these with these voyages uh, typically between 10 and 15 if we have 10 and 15 people sign up um then we can uh, yeah we'll definitely have a rock jumper guide on board um, but otherwise, yes, you're in fantastic hands, though, with the uh, with the team that Quark's going to assemble as well. So, yeah. Uh, we would love to have somebody from Rock Jumper traveling yeah. with us. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The value is huge. So, yes. Um, absolutely. <laughs> then approximately how long are your Zodiac tours from? Sure. So every day we try to do an excursion in the morning and an excursion in the afternoon. Our Zodiac tours can be anywhere from around an hour to two and a half hours in length, uh, depending on how cold we are, of course, as a group of people, we wanna make sure that we're always thinking about each other when we're out in the boats, um, or how the weather is turning, a uh, fog is setting in. Usually it's anywhere from around an hour and a half to two hours. However, some people ask this question and I'm not sure if I'm going in the right direction, but I, I do like to address this. If you need to go back to the ship for any reason, we absolutely can do that. And then we can wait for you and continue on with our exploration. Um, just so that everybody's aware, we are more focused on compassion in our expeditions than anything else. So if you're cold, if you forgot gloves, please just ask. I always have three extra sets of gloves when I'm driving um, because it happens, you get excited and sometimes we forget to prepare. So just mm -hmm. make sure that you know anywhere from around an hour, generally up to the two hour limit uh, is how long we would be in a Zodiac for. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, I think we've now come to the end of um, all our questions. And I'm just going to end off with one comment that Robin posted on the chat. And I thought it was so beautiful. Thank you so much, Robin. I took the grand tour of Antarctica with Quark in 2008. And I can assure you that Quark is everything that David talked about. Quality, quality, quality. With talks every night, including photo show shows uh, from participants. We were given the yellow parkas that you see and a PowerPoint show on a CD when we left the ship. 
I've also done four trips with Rock Dumper. Their bird guides are super. Thank you so much for the beautiful comments. We really appreciate thank it. You. And, and thank no, you so much, Naomi. Thank you, David. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak oh, to thank us. Thank you very much to you. Thank you for having us. It's always, uh, it's always such a joy. So really, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, and, wonderful. Yeah, from all of us, from the Rock Dumper and Quark team, um, thank you for joining us and I uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. Yes. Cheers, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Bye. day.